past curator, I guess we'd say, uh, past director of the Acadian Museum in Iraq. That, uh, I don't know if you've all visited, but I really enjoyed. It's the only time I've gone, but I plan to go back more. And I spent about three hours there, and I could spend an easy three or maybe six more hours uh, going through that stuff. It's really great. Um, he was also instrumental in obtaining the official British government apology for the deportation that took place back in 1755, of expelling the French from the Acadian region of Canada. And very instrumental in that. So, uh, Eric, Eric, you had something else you wanted to say? Uh, well, I just want to say that uh, I'm very proud to have Mr. Perrin here today. I have uh, family ties to the Warren that I'm proud to, to, to say. Uh, I grew up hanging out with his son, Andy, and I believe you were fraternity brothers with my father. Is that correct? Sure. Who is here in the back room? But uh, young men. <laughs> um, and uh, also in my music world, you know, I, I stay in the cultural scene and I can confidently say and add to uh, Dick's introduction that there have been very few Louisianians in my opinion that have done more for cultural activism than Warren Perry. Uh, it's been tremendous his body of life's work to help promote our Canadian culture, our French language, and Louisiana as a whole all over the world and he's been recognized for it internationally. Uh, so it's a real pleasure to have him and he took me on my very first duck hunt. <laughs> and I live to tell the story. I almost froze to death. <laughs> but uh, without further ado, give a big round of warm of applause for our guest speaker. It's, it's impossible not to mention my cousin, Yuna D. Evans, who helped start this organization. And I was with him in the beginning. I can remember spending many hours working on some of her ideas. It's great. So, what we're going to do is we're going to go through a PowerPoint. It's a complicated subject. I'm going to try to keep it as simple as possible because I know Roger Point is in the audience. We don't want to confuse him. No, don't. <laughs> Another one of my fraternity directors is Roger Point. But you might want to ask the question why am I holding a book of a weight lifter from Japan to start my talk? It's because this is one of the main reasons I drafted and launched a petition for an apology. I was a member of the weightlifting team, and this weightlifter named Walter Amahara got started in weightlifting here in Abbeville by Mike Stansberry. He started the first gym, he started the first weightlifting team at USL, and they won the first national championship in any sport. It was weightlifting in 1957. And this man here led the team. So I wrote that this is my latest book, this is my fun book, is to tell that story about Mike Stansberry and this team won eight national championships. I was on three of the teams in the mid-60s, and a documentary film is doing great on this right now. I knew Walter's story. At four years old, his family was put on a train by the U.S. Army and told they were going to be in a concentration camp for the duration of the war. They lost that one in California, California, and they spent the entire war in an internment camp in the swamps of southern Arkansas. He was four years old. His mother was pregnant. They had eight children. They had such a large family, they couldn't put him in a room. They had to put him literally in a barn where they could build a room to house him. So Walter told me that story. Most Americans never heard of that story. America wasn't proud of that era. But 1988, the U.S. government, through President Ronald Reagan, signed an apology to every living Japanese American. There's 120,000 of them that were submitted to that. And each one was sent a $20,000 check. The government put out $1.8 billion to show their apology. When I saw that, I called Walter and I congratulated him, and it made me realize 
The same thing that had happened to Walter's family and Walter had happened to our ancestors, the Acadians. Just like we illegally deported them and took their lands, that's what the British did. So this was the inspiration, and it took me two more years before I actually put it together and launched it because I had a lot of research to do. And I, had, I got a lot of help from a lot of smart people from all over the world. But that's what I looked like 19 years ago. <laughs> and uh, the original document is in the archives of Canada in Ottawa, but they're the only place that we, we were given a signed copy, which is on display at the Museum of the Air. So I have a copy of that copy on the table there for anybody to see. And we recently had the mayor of Iraq tell you, Conchie, signed a proclamation that it will be annually celebrated in Iraq. The special day is July 28th, because that's the day when the British governor signed the law of deportation, July 28th, 1755, in Halifax, Nova Scotia. So, uh, Eric, let's go to the first slide and we'll try to keep these as brief as possible. If you hold your questions to the beginning, that would be great. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. So this is the day, well, we, our ancestors left in this region Western part around Brittany to South of Normandy is where they, were, they left. I figured a, a way to tell people about this story using the pilgrims. It's a story with children. And because it, deportation is a complicated story, it's convoluted, it goes over 250 years. But in 1604, the Acadians left France. They were hand picked. They were hand picked to settle, not for religious persons although they were all Catholic. At, six, at the same time, in 1604, the Anglican Church and the British government kicked the pilgrims out of England, and they were forced to go to Holland, where they remained for 16 years. In 1620, the Acadians were so close to the Native American Mi'kmaq people that were intermarried, because they didn't have women there yet. So it was the Mi'kmaq women comforting the men with cold winter nights. At that same time, those same pilgrims called Puritans were kicked out of Holland. They had to go somewhere else. Most people, they were cuckoo birds. They were off the rails. They were fanatics. They went on the Mayflower. Their leader was a man named Edward Winslow. He, he wrote the, the Pilgrim Compact before they got off the boat. The reason I'm telling you this is because Edward Winslow's great-grandson was John Winslow. He led the deportation of the Acadians. So it was descendants of pilgrims who deported the Acadians. It didn't come from London. It wasn't ordered ever by the home government. It was an action that was hatched and carried out by New Englanders. And I'm going to tell you how this story, and if you don't think the pilgrims were cuckoo, you know what they were doing in 1680 when the Acadians were experimenting with representative government electing deputies to vote for them for their, which wasn't, wasn't even a, a known theory then. And they were picking this up from the Native Americans. And the Native Americans were teaching the Acadians, don't let government dictate your lives. There's a higher being, so you have no right to be mistreated by government. So the Acadians were picking up these ideas that were so close to the Mi'kmaq. In 1680, when that was happening, you know what was happening in, in Salem, Massachusetts? Salem witch trials. They were burning their teenage dogs at the stake. These people were strange birds. They were slaughtering the Indians. The Acadians were mad at the Indians. I'm telling you this story so you'll understand better. These two people next door to each other, because Acadia included the state of Maine, Four provinces, Prince Edward Island, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, and Maine. So they were bumping up for the pilgrims. And so for the next 150 years, they were in total competition. And they hated each other with a passion. Ultimately, the pilgrims had the military might to deport and take the lands to the Acadians. Because you go to Nova Scotia today, you don't find British people on their lands. You find the, the descendants of the pilgrims that took all the lands. That's my introduction. Did it?
nice to compare the pilgrims to because of the time period. It's hard to, if you don't get into that, you don't relate it as well to that. And so, oh uh, yeah, here you go. Nova Scotia is a big uh, one in number seven, and it's attached to the, the Canada by the Chinicto Peninsula. Now, all the water, the tide from the whole Atlantic Ocean races on the United States and it goes northward and it gets trapped in the Beaubassin, right there in the Bay of Plenty. So you have the highest tides in the world, 84 foot tides at Beaubassin. That's important because it would flood all the marshlands. And the Indians told the Acadians, don't, don't plant on our hunting grounds. They're sacred, leave us alone. You can go and reclaim the marsh and you have rich soil once you use the salt out of the marshes. So if there's one word that distinguishes the Acadian is the word aquato. Aquato is a flat valve made of wood. It was a tree, hollow it out, put a valve. So when the tide would come in, the valve would shut. We all know what a flat valve is. When it would rain, the water would drain the marshes, the valve would be open. So that aquato allowed the Acadians quickly to be able to successfully produce their own crops. When the pilgrims were having trouble, having children live, the Acadians had the highest birth rate ever recorded in North America. Every 20 years, they doubled their population. The average families to our kids. The pilgrims were having trouble keeping one or two alive. The, the food that the Acadians grew made the women healthy. They picked up birth control methods from the native plants, and so they would have their babies in the summer, not in the winter. And so that population explosion going on in the north <coughs> of the pilgrims had them scared to death because they could see themselves ultimately being taken up by the population of the Achaeans. Next. So again, this shows the marshes around uh, this one of the next one. That was their first settlement, the habitation, which is a, today a big national fort called Fort Royal. It's the next one. And you can see, you can actually see the marshes around the fort. You see how the, the water around this area, it's all marshland, just like over here. And a lot of the caves that came south of Louisiana, my ancestor, Neil Broussard, who uh, Ronnie Broussard knows well, was one of the first settlers in Prairie River. And that's exactly what he did. He reclaimed a thousand acres from the marsh. By building on the edge, we still have today. So uh, the first thing we asked for was the restoration of our great name. If you don't remember anything about what I'm telling you tonight, here's the most important takeaway. The Acadians stopped calling themselves French and started calling themselves French neutrals, and then ultimately les Acadiens. They developed a new ethnicity wholly in North America only people to ever do that. Every other ethnicity came to America to become Americans. Canadians, Americans, Mexicans, but not the Acadians. They developed a new way of viewing life and called themselves French neutrals because they refused to participate in any war. They wanted to be neutral. During this 150 years that Acadie, the colony existed, it changed hands eight times. England, France, England, France, England, France. So the Acadians quickly learned, if you just be quiet, be still, the next government's coming back, so I'm not taking sides. So that, that was their way of doing it. So these items are what I put in my lawsuit, which we're gonna quickly go through. Where did I get that? Abbeville Man, Dudley J. O'Kill. Who's Aunt Doug wrote a I don't think he wrote the book, but he had, he paid some good historians to write his first book, of Cave Miracle, because it was fantastic. And he found a petition prepared by the Acadians deported to Philadelphia. And two men brought it to the king and asked King George for certain things. That was number one. But the king wouldn't see him. So I took Kuzan Dillard's work, his petition that he found, and I attached it to my lawsuit. And I said, it never will be described because my petition was filed in 1760, but was early in the So my lawsuit was taking their petition 
to the federal court then. I never had to do that, but that was our plan. Okay, go to the next one. They, they wanted an inquiry to, of independent people to show that their deportation was illegal. We asked for the same thing. I knew we, had, we were gonna win the suit as soon as we could prove that the Acadians had been granted the status of British subjects, and they were. Ultimately, I had to became Nova Scotia as part of a treaty, it became British territory. Good Queen Anne was in charge, and they call her Good Queen Anne because she was a good queen. And she knew that Acadians were good people and she wanted them to stay and help develop Nova Scotia. They were all Catholic. You couldn't practice Catholicism in the British, in the British territory. So she granted an exception to them, to the Treaty of Utrecht. And she said, if y'all stay, I'm gonna give you a British status, you'll have all the rights of the British subject. All I want you to do is stay. So they had to decide, they had one year, <clears throat> like the commercial, do I stay or do I go? They had to make some big decisions. Now, about half of them left, led by Beausoleil Rousseau, who was sort of the leader. He didn't trust the British. But those who stayed became British subjects and could keep title to their lands. Those who left lost their lands that had been settled for 50 years. <clears throat> so, in, in the deportation order, I have a copy of it in the museum, it's, it called the Acadians British subjects who were not loyal to their oaths. So they had to give a pretext for deporting them. But by calling them British subjects, I knew they had to be granted the rights of British subjects. And, and I found a petition of right in 1620 by the king right after the Magna Carta, a couple, of, a couple of hundred years later after the Magna Carta. They expanded the Magna Carta into the petition of right, and they said, no British subject can be deported or exiled except by act of parliament. So I knew I had one. Those pilgrims had violated British law by deporting British subjects. Why do you think they sent them to the British colonies? They were British subjects. They couldn't send them back to France. They weren't British subjects. Okay? And that's what shocked the Acadians that they were put on boats and sent to the British colonies. They thought they were going to be going back to France. But no, they wanted, and they dropped them all along the, you can go to the next one. They brought them all along the British colonies down to Savannah, Georgia to separate them. And they took their kids into voluntary servitude. And it was a terrible, terrible time during this French and Indian War, which was going on to determine who controlled North America. And it was the first world war ever. Every country in the world in 1760 was involved in the Seven Years' War and the French and Indian War. And of course, the Britain prevailed and they defeated the French. Quebec. So this is a reminder of the relationship between the Mi'kmaq and the Acadians. You can't overestimate how much they helped in this. It's impossible. And I'm a, my mother was a blue star, and I tested DNA, and I came up 18% Native American Mi'kmaq, because Bolsonaro's great grandmother was a Mi'kmaq. So we asked for an order declaring the end of the deportation. Now, Timing is everything. This was granted in 2003. You know what happened in 2004? The Royal Acadian Reunion was held in Nova Scotia. And I was telling their, their lawyers, no, no cages, don't expect any cages to come back. I'm telling everybody, we still want an order of deportation. We have an order. So the Department of Security is coming. So timing is everything. Uh, another thing that's important about timing is I launched it in 1990. The, I didn't plan this, I just decided, okay, we're gonna do it in 1990. The Berlin Wall fell in 89. The Soviet Union collapsed in 91. So the 90s, that was a decade of peace. There were no wars going on in the 90s. So it allowed countries to look at their histories introspectively and see how they were more understanding what they had done wrong. How we started apologizing for things. When I started this in 90, British Crown had never apologized for anything in their thousand year history. Nothing. Okay? 
but in 95, Elizabeth left and apologized to the Maori Indians in New Zealand. So I knew I had a shot when she did that. It, the British literally killed every full-blooded Maori Indian. And Tasmanian people also on that island. They, 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 there's no full-blooded Tasmanian in the world because they, they hunted them like rabbits. The British would just walk across the island. The way that they were thinking then, Darwinism. If we can't make these natives Christian, they're better off dead. We gotta kill them because they're gonna they're gonna keep producing children. They won't be Christian. So that's why they were killing these things during the period. Okay, next. We wanted an acknowledgement. That's like an apology. The British government had never admitted they had anything to do with the deportation. Their official position was it was a local action. They had nothing to do with this. But of course, there's a lot of other reasons why we could prove that they had at least tacitly helped him and allowed it to happen. And all the men who participated were granted higher titles. They were rewarded for having it taken place. The best analogy I've ever come up with is the Iran-Contra affair. I know I'm going more back than some of y'all, but Oliver North concocted a scheme in the White House against the law of trading arms to the Contras in Nicaragua by, by, by rerouting it to Saudi Arabia. So, and he was caught, and he was convicted, and he was reduced, and was reversed on appeal, but that's what happened. John Winslow and his motley crew out of Boston violated British law to serve a purpose which ultimately benefited England because they, they took over all the lands in Nova Scotia. So that's to me the most myth that people don't understand. It, it really didn't come out of London, it came out of Boston. Okay, next. And that's what I've told you all about this. It's a contrary to existing law. I didn't make this stuff up. This is in that petition those Acadians drew up in 1760. They weren't fools. Okay, next. So I wanted a symbolic gesture because in the famous poem that Longfellow wrote, Evangelist, that's the last line in the poem. The exile begins never to end. So I was trying to bring it to a close. Closure, get, get it behind us. And when the deportation happened in 1755, for the next century, they call it the century of silence. There's no songs written about it, no poems, no stories, no books, nothing. Both, everybody wanted to forget about it. The British wanted to hide it. The Cajuns, the Cajuns who came to Louisiana became Cajuns. They just wanted to get on with their lives. Those people all over the world just wanted to forget about it. A young student from St. Martinville has, he's in college in Boston, he tells his professor about his ancestors being deported to Canadians, and the professor tells Longfellow and Hawthorne, and Longfellow writes the classic poem. If that doesn't happen, we're not here talking about any of this. That's no case, the word Cajun doesn't exist. We're forgotten, gone. The book captivates the world, number one selling book for 14 years. And for 50 years, every high school student had to read it. Sometimes they could memorize a lot of it. Because it was so, it was the first great poem written by an American poet. And interestingly, for the first time, started a woman who was strong, resolute, determined, evangelist, did everything she could to find godly help on the eve of her irrevocable acceptance. Never could find him, although she came close to finding him in St. Martinville. And she ultimately finds him. She hears her name spoken in a poorhouse in Philadelphia, where she has joined the nun, nun, Sister of Mercy, caring for the poor. And he is dying, and he calls out her name, doesn't know she's there. And she comes over, who calls my name? Evangelist. And they look at each other, and she hugs him. Great story, right? But that really happens to a lot of things. But that was total fiction. But Longfellow researched it correctly. He went to the library. We know I saw the library cards, but he, he researched books on Louisiana, he researched what was available. So we know his sources were good. And uh, 
it, you need to thank him for that. But I wanted to get away from the idea that, you know, we're always going to be a perpetual people in exile. A diaspora, diaspora is a scattering to the winds, and that's what we were. In one of our books, which is on the table here, we identify 40 places in the world where you can go today, and you will find a museum, or a festival, or a fair, or some manifestation of the cave of Vision. Forty places. Okay, thanks. About five million Acadians estimated in the world today. So the legal background, of course, it's hard to imagine the turmoil that was going on. It's, and it was a diabolically, perfectly executed scheme of how to trap the Acadian men. And it almost brings me to tears when I say that every time because I have a 10 year old grandson. A 10 year old boy is considered a man. So they announced that every church had to be filled at 3 o'clock on September 5th, 1755, by every man in the parish. So the men had to bring their 10 year old boys. As soon as they went to church, they read the proclamation, they lied. They said, In the name of the king, he is ordering you to be exiled, and all that you own except what you can carry by hand is forfeited to the ground. And they locked the doors, and it took about another month to bring in the ships, because the ships were hidden. They didn't want their names to see the ships. They sent them all away. And so the women had to come feed the men in the churches. You can imagine these boys, the last time many of them saw their mothers. And um, so the, the, the scene as depicted by some people, now the best account well, several dollars killed. Uh, no dollar has ever been found by a They have paid a lot of prisoners, but there were diaries kept by some British soldiers, and importantly, John Winslow, the pilgrim. He kept the best diary. He was the man in charge of Grand Prix, which was the biggest village. And he kept his diaries in the Massachusetts State Archives. And it's like you read what you saw. Nuremberg trials, where the German Nazi officers on trial would say, I was just following orders. Just following orders. I didn't want to do it. And that's what this, this John Winslow would write is at night, he'd say, it's against my nature what I'm doing, but I'm going to do it when I can. I'm do it when I can. But, you know, following orders. So they had 200,000 head of livestock. You can imagine. They had just, they let them harvest their crops. Their barns were full of, of wheat and hay. So they would torch the barns and they would just go up. They burned everything. I mean, there were very few structures left because they didn't want to come back. So, they did. so go to the next one. As a general rule, um, that's good. That just shows the ships leaving and not, they don't know where they're going. And they, these ships were leased. Transport cattle. These were not, these were not ocean liners, okay? So their accommodations were horrible. And they used the same ships to come back and capture as much of the livestock the Acadians and sell it, pocket the money. But a lot of these animals died. I mean, some of them were getting fed. So uh, as a general rule, 15,000 Acadians at that time in Nova Scotia. 5,000 put on ships. 5,000 escaped. Also, they and his crew escaped, went, went, lived with the Nickman during the war in the woods. And 5,000 perished. Their ships went down. Some entire family lines were wiped out. Some families were way to stay together. By and large, they were separated. And the chaos, it was total chaos. And uh, those statistics. 5,000 died, one third, pursuant to the number of Jewish people who perished in their Holocaust. But their numbers were millions. It was supposed to be 18 million, 6 million perished in the Holocaust. But it's the same percentages. And they say if the deportation had never taken place, we would have overrun New York and Boston. The population said in North America. So on the 250th anniversary, I had my son, Andy, 
who is an architect and a big thing, Gene Knight, no end in the sun, and the Larry Gillis. Andy designed this poster. He put on a plate at the uh, old US Mint in Bridgeport. It was a two hour plate. We had about 75 people, and it was a smash hit where we, we put on the arrival and the story of how we came. It's gone to New Orleans on February 12, 1765. And we showed the people. We depicted Rosa Langley Sawyer. He was in his 60s, and they lived in prison for four years, so he could barely walk on shore. And it's, it was over. And he found a sketch of the boardwalk of Port New Orleans, and he said, Little church. That's where the St. Louis Cathedral was ultimately built. Little church. It's reported that these are in records which we have in the state archives. The, the, the government of New Orleans was, was French, but it had been sold to Spain, so they were taken. It's a transitional government. And so uh, the acting French government was delegated, and he took a lot of records. He said, We don't know who these people are. Oh, they're Acadians. Oh, they're good people. We're going to try to convince them to stay here. We need settlers. And so that's the only account you get is from Robert Lee Brown's. But he wrote, they got off the boat. They knelt in prayer as they were kneeling in prayer. And then they got up and danced. What a, what a good symbolism. They said they both want to do it. They got up and danced. And so they stayed there for four weeks in a warehouse in Algiers Point. And Wilson Lane negotiated the Butcher and Cattle Compact, which got them the attack of war in the Bayou Terre. And uh, the food went through archaeologist Dr. Porter Reese, uh, Dr. Reese, um, that the first settlement of Friday Road. You have the public that announced that the New York and Durham had to not cover during the Grand Reve Acadia. Now, that play, we have been asked to replay it. To replay the play? We will put on a second performance in Madeline Square on October 1st mm -hmm. to close the opening day of the Grand Reve Acadia. We're going to, you know, instead of two hours, we're going to shorten it to one hour. And we did have music in the first one, but we're going to have a lot more music in the second one. Maybe Eric and I will some music. <laughs> so it's going to be more of a music and some history, but we're going to tell that same story. Now, the story I just told you, isn't that just as incredible as what the Angelus story is? You know, it's just, they baptized the first baby in the church, so we know the baby arrived and confirms that. We know her name. She was a typical. Okay, go to the next one. So that's your dog story. It, you know, this is what happened after. They signed a peace treaty, and everybody could go home. The French soldiers that lost the freaking war lost nothing. They just went back to Quebec, or they went back to France. They were honored soldiers. In the Treaty of Paris, they accept the Acadians. They treated Acadians as though we were a nation fighting the war and loss. But they were doing that so we couldn't go home. So everybody can go home except the Acadians. If you want to see it, I have it in the DRAC, in the Royal Proclamation Room, the actual Treaty of Paris, saying that. So we had nobody at the table negotiating the treaty, but they didn't want to lose their most valuable lands. That was so productive, it's still the most productive land in Canada. So, uh, but, so they couldn't go home. So this is where they tried to go. Talking Falkland Islands down there, French Guiana, uh, all the French Caribbean islands. If you go to uh, those islands today, don't you know, have the names of Canadian names? Guadeloupe and those areas. A lot went to Quebec. About the same number that went to, about 3,000 went back to Quebec. About 3,000 came from Louisiana. About 3,000, 2,000 went back to France. And you might say, why did some go to France? Those who were French subjects living on French lands, like Cape Breton, like if, if, if they caught a Frenchman, they he could they 
were sending back to France. So you end up with 2,000 Acadians stuck in France for 30 years, begging the French government to let them come join those slaves group in Louisiana. And after 30 years of begging, in 1785, the king of Spain, who owned Louisiana then in 1785, he was a Spanish colony from 1763 to 1800. So Spain wanted to bring settlers, like they settled in North America, that all settlers from Spain. So Galvez was the governor, and Galvez got all of his friends from Spain to come settle in North America. It was all his friends and relatives. It was golden opportunities. So all these French people had been on the well of their, of their friends. They refused to work. They said, we're going to go back and try our friends. The king, to entice them to stay, created welfare. You understand? No government had ever given money to people not to work. The church would do that. Alms. Okay? Families would take care of people, not the government. But the king of Spain, you probably never heard of this before, the king of Spain reimbursed the king of France 60% of the money he had put out if he let him come to Louisiana. That's how they brokered that deal. And so the state, the state, Seven ships were chartered. One year, seven ships were chartered. Almost 2,000 came from France to Louisiana. Now, those people mostly settled the Bush Terrible parishes because the first Acadians had taken the Prairie Land. So, those were more the wetland settlements. The largest group came from Maryland. Maryland had about 600. And I'm going to host the expert. Maryland Acadians, who just published a book, The Acadians of Maryland. Greg Woods will stay at my farm in Henry for a week, and he will participate in that play we're going to put on. I'm going to write a part for him to say how the Maryland Acadians came. <coughs> so those, uh, one guy from uh, where is he? Uh, France, he wrote a book, Those Acadians from France. And he made me realize for the first time the dilemma those people in France had when they were given permission to leave. Again, do I stay or do I go? Okay? By and large, the older people, they couldn't see crossing the ocean again, so they stayed. So it was mostly the young unmarried because some of those had developed relationships and didn't want to leave. So it was, what was it doing again? Tearing families apart. So um, it's a fascinating story, and he's still learning stuff. I just read an article um, that sets forth the theory the Acadian deportation set the stage for the American Revolution. Why? Because those Acadians in the British colonies, well, the people were told they had to shelter, clothe, and feed. That's part of their religion. The Acadians. They had, to, they had to shelter, feed, and clothe their enemies during the war. The government didn't take care of those Acadians. The local villagers did. Put them in barns, put them to work. They weren't prisoners, but they couldn't leave. <laughs> and so, um, it, it's just an um, amazing story that the debts that these local governments started accumulating caused them to raise taxes, causing the loss of the Party just 10 years later. So we're talking about the same time period. And so the, the revolutionary fervor was developed by the raising of the taxes, because in part, not totally, but in part, by what they had to bear for seven years they had to feed these people. And we know what they sell, so we can come. There was no law providing for the penalty. I think Mr. Luque helped a lot with that. Gail helped me do a lot of research. Gail Luque, I'm sure you all know it. But he, he helped me finalize a lot of these theories. That was, there was no law that allowed you to punish the whole family if one person in the family committed a crime. And that's what they had to do to justify the entire family. There was no law for that. Next. 
best. Okay, that's just, uh, I covered that already. The king, the, it was only the king of Parliament that could have voted at that time. So that's why, that's why the women acknowledged the law. Next. And every story has a bad, bad dude. This is the one. <laughs> Although I, I've been mentioning John Winslow because Winslow was a rich, rich, powerful man in Boston. But this is the guy who was a bad dude. Nobody liked him. His servants did like him. And he was the one that asked Winslow to, to call out the militia. He put an ad in the newspaper. And it's like Game of Thrones, you know, they're coming from the north. Winter's coming. It was like threatening. These Catholics are going to take us over. I need you all to join the militia. Come join us. And that's where 800 men joined Winslow as, a, as an order of the governor, the lieutenant governor. He, later, he was lieutenant governor. He did an illegal act. act and then they made a governor. So they rewarded him for his deeds. Because they liked what ultimately he did. Mr. Warren, lieutenant governor of where? Nova Scotia. Nova Scotia. Yeah. Okay, next. I mentioned the genocide one third. This is a new term. We, we don't want to take the terms, most of the language of the Jewish people, but most historians are now saying it was genocide. It's part of the destruction of that new culture in North America. So, next. Uh, I have, this is my, Bruce is now 30 years old, so this was in 1994. I was hosted by an expert in, in, in uh, international law, and he helped me prepare a lot of the petition. He was a law professor at the University of Buffalo in Canada, and we had dinner at his house, and he helped me write a talk I made at a human rights conference in Paris. Every year they invite 10 lawyers to do an actual talk on a real case on human rights. And I was selected. And the winner got $10,000. And all of us got our expenses paid. It was three day vacation families. And uh, two big things happened there. Number one, after I made my talk, I was interviewed by a reporter from London who wrote for the. Uh, Communist magazine, probably the biggest magazine in the world. And he wrote an article in that magazine saying, it's time the Crown acknowledged the deportation orders. So that was a big boost for me. And I got people from all over the world starting to help. I found England is their history, a lot of people don't like England. So the second big thing that happened, the winner of the contest was a young Canadian boy named Joelette. And so, as we all do, I invited everybody at the dinner we had to come visit the museum. So Jean, Jean jumps up, Jean Wallet. He said, I saw a picture of your daughter. I want to come. <laughs> <laughs> so he came, they fell in love, they got married. And we thought they were moving to Canada. Jean calls me, he said, I want to practice law in Louisiana. Luckily for Jean, the only two places with the Louisiana Civil Code is still in effect, Quebec and Louisiana. So the Supreme Court reviewed his records and they let him take the bar, although he was not supposed to allow that. They let him an exception. He had never taken a test in English, all French is Quebec. But he moved in our house and I would tutor him on the law and Mary would teach him how to write sentences. He passed the bar the first time he took it and he became managing partner of my firm. He's retired now, but I have two grandkids called them my Quebec Cajuns. <laughs> okay, so that's why I have this to remind me to tell you that story. So it's personal to us, too. Okay, uh, th this is only to tell you why uh, everything under the law has a, a time period except murder. So I, I knew they'd throw that at me. You waited 252 years too late. But I, I had that background that I was using that. Petition filed in 1760 as a standard description. Next. Hope I'm not getting too technical for you, Mark. I've seen those phrases before. <laughs> so, uh, I read a book called uh, Dead Certainties. And uh, 
very much what they said. You've got to read that book. And uh, it's a professor that showed how many times in history, history was written by the victor of the throne. So you always have to challenge history. So that's why I, I had a clause, it's never too late to write it in. That's the first uh, Acadian government we talk about. What was the name of the book? What was the name of the book? Dead Certainties. Dead Certainties. Dead Certainties. Professor Shalom from Yale University. Next. Uh, I have this to remind myself in case I hadn't told you about Walter Muhammad. That's, that's part of why I have this in here. Okay, next. Uh, Canada's apologized at the same time, so it's still ongoing. You know where the Pope is right now. He's still trying to apologize to Canada for what they did to the church. But I'm, I'm going to quickly go through these other examples which were helpful as the world was coming around to some of these. Uh, next. Uh, did y'all know? Well, we know North and South Korea have still never settled the war. Next. World War II has never been settled between Russia and China. It's all these old things kind of hanging, and I was using that as an example. We got to bring it to a close. Yes, next. Next. These are just other, we don't have to spend much time. Next. <laughs> I apologize. This, uh, it's a cute thing, but one of the World Academy reunions, I was a guest speaker at the Bristol like that. So they had just signed the apology. And they had it up front, and they had a woman who's an imposter of the queen, personally, <laughs> she dressed just like just, just like the queen. And they, they walked her out on stage, and I thought it was the queen. <laughs> and they had the guy, like a Secret Service guy, and they had like a person <laughs> the scene. And so she read the apology, as though it was the queen there. So we had fun with that. Uh, and uh, next, go ahead. Next. Uh, this is an interesting story. It appeared right after the Civil War in the most popular magazine in America was Harper's Magazine. And somebody came down to Louisiana and depicted the Cajuns in a horrific way. It's sort of like the beginning of us being criticized as dumb commences. Okay? Mm -hmm. They didn't say anything good. It's like they're lazy, they're, they don't care about this. And so you would never have depicted a woman with her legs spread, a bus slot showing, revealing. The man looks like he's lecherous, you know, he's like choosing which one. So we've been fighting that stereotype, really, because we, why? Because we were French neutrals and not Kaiken. And we were a different thinking people. We were always sort of foreigners in our Next. Next. These will come, and that's, that's the end of the PowerPoint. And I'm going to conclude by saying I prepared a short paper. I keep adding, and I'll find out what came out of this notebook for this. I'll, I'll hit on two or three. The French immersion students, they learned the proclamation because it's French and English, side by side, it's not long. If you can understand everything that's said in that proclamation, you know it's a history. So they use it in school. They use it online on a lot of the online <coughs> classes now. I'm giving them permission to use a lot of our stuff. They're teaching college and, and high school history. That's good. Canada started a human rights museum in Winnipeg, and we have a whole wall dedicated to this, this whole thing. So it resonates. And uh, as you probably remember hearing recently, Queen Elizabeth celebrated her 70th anniversary of her naming to the crown. <clears throat> I get a phone call from a reporter in London. It, uh, she says, uh, I have been charged to write the Queen's biography. And I want to interview you. I said, why do you want to interview me? She said, you're the only person that I've ever seen the Queen. And I want to know what you think about me. I said, okay. So she started asking these questions. And she said, well, what do you think about Queen? I said, well, your Queen is the most wonderful, 
smart, kind person that's ever lived because <laughs> she did the right thing. I just gave her the opportunity to do it and allowed her. It was the sixth apology in the history of the crime. Now, there have been a lot more since, but uh, it was uh, a good feeling to accomplish. I'm going to do this one. I'm concluding my talk and now with the air available to answer any questions. Where did that come? Warren, when this was all going on, it, it, was any offer of settlement made uh, to your father to anger? I did not sue for money. I knew right off the bat that it never happened if you sued for money. So, <clears throat> about three years into it, they hired a lawyer to work with. I mean, I, I dealt with the law firm in Houston, Texas the whole time. And uh, when reporters would call the British um, Embassy, the official position was, we don't know who Mr. Barron is, or why you're asking, but we don't revisit history. That was their official position when I was dealing with lawyers, but you know, I couldn't, I wasn't worried about what they were saying. I was getting, getting, I was accomplishing things through their lawyers. They weren't starting to understand. Maybe we can work, work it out. So one day I get a call from the lawyer and he says, I know you didn't sue for money, but how about a million dollars? And we will endow a chair at the University of your choice to study the Cadence of history. Great. I ran over to see Ray Audemars, Gary Murata, vice president. They were all excited. To tell you how serious this got, they sent Professor Robert Lewis from Birmingham University, Birmingham, and he came to spend five days in Lafayette, touring the campus, interviewing professors to make sure that money would be well protected. And right before we closed the deal, the lawyer throws me a curve and he said, Oh, we're going to have you sign a document saying we can never disclose where the money came from or why. Secrecy. That's a bullshit. I said, I did this to bring to the attention of the world what happened to the Acadians, not to sign an oath of secrecy. That's not going to work. So we stopped talking. And uh, the big break came because of the Prime Minister Jean Chrétien came. Because I had. I was given 15 minutes with him and uh, to ask him to help us. Because I, I had pushed it as far as I could. It happened in Canada, I knew it had to come from the Canadian. The Canadian government had to be involved. And he said, I'm going to help you. And two years later, he made it happen to his ministers. And so the official inquiry that we asked for, anybody in the world had 60 days to give an opinion, yes or no. Most of the historians did. And it was 98 to 2. Two people said we shouldn't do this, 98 said yes. But then it took another year <clears throat> to write up the document. Because from the get-go, we knew they would never bend the knee, say we, they went groveling. They were just, for the first time, saying, yes, we did it. In our name, we're responsible for deaths and dying. We acknowledge that fact. And then this, this day of July 28th, which is tomorrow, was picked as a day of remembrance. So tomorrow, we're going to open the museum for the guests. And we're all welcome in the afternoon from 1 to 4. And then we're going to go to a French mass in St. Martinville, dedicated to the Cadians who died. And then we're going to do a ceremony and have a reception at St. Martin Cade Memorial. You all are all welcome. Thanks for that question. Maybe I should have taken a million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And you could come talk to us. Yeah. Warren, the story about Beausoleil and moving to the Apache Falls area, is there something we can, uh, a resource we can read up on that? I happen to have his biography on the table right now. That's the first book I wrote in 1994. Because I always wondered how we ended up here. Cattle. They had cattle in Nova Scotia, they had cattle in France. My family still has cattle. I also heard that you do too. Two Spanish people trying to attract Catholics. Catholics were predominantly Catholic. But it was Catholic. Not Catholic. Catholic. Because there was a guy named Dotry who had a bunch of wild cattle herded up, but he didn't have any workers. He couldn't keep people working out here. Nobody was here. You know? And uh, so they did a cattle compact, sharecropping cattle. 
So that's what war is. Work for Deutsch's cattle farm. As soon as they got, and they signed the document, we have a copy of the museum. It's a one page document to show how they considered themselves Mi'kmaq and not American or French. Every man signed as chief of their tribe. And on, on both sides both, there were 30 chiefs. That means 30 family head, head of a family. 30, two women, 28 men. A Bernard woman and a Thibodeau. Their husbands had died or they did other most of his life, we don't know what happened to her. She probably died in prison in Halifax. But um, it's cattle that got them on their feet right away. And Mary and I went to speak at the University of Texas in Austin. And I gave this talk, just like this, but I spent a lot more time on the cattle because my big, my big punch was, guess who were the first cowboys in America? <laughs> 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 they still looked around like, what? I said, 1767. They were driving cattle from the Tapico to New Orleans through the swamp. And they had a bull that would lead them across all the, the rivers. Because a bull swims in a straight line across the swamp. So, wow. I hate to tell you that thing. That's true. You need a bull to go through water. And let me finish one more yeah, right. And within one generation, they were wealthy. They, it took them one generation because of cattle. They were just everything they could. Because what they did, I have to tell you this. As soon as they got here and they saw all the other wild cattle, they tore up Dotrude's contract. They ignored it and then they changed their own cows. <laughs> and they got sued. So they were tech do, you know, they did what they had to do. And Amon Rousseau was Beausoleil's youngest, and that's how we know they were wealthy, because we had a succession in the courthouse of St. Martin. And he died a very wealthy man, the son of Beausoleil. Took over the book right after Bosley died. And uh, there's a book, if y'all want to read more about Amon Rousseau, it's called uh, Independence Lost by Elizabeth Duval, is for the University of South Carolina. She wrote a book, Seven People Who Helped Win the Revolutionary War That Nobody Knows About. And Amon Rousseau is one that she devotes a third of the book to. Because he joined Galvez's army to go defeat the British in the Battle of Baton Rouge, Pensacola, and Mobile, and allowed Wash George Washington to forget about the South. The, the Spanish took care of the British. And, and Amon was asked to stay with Galvez as his lieutenant. And he was happy to do that because he was getting to shoot back at the British. <laughs> the damage, you see. And in the book, uh, there's a chapter how they laid siege to the big British fort at the Pensacola. And when that fort fell, Yorktown, British surrendered from Yorktown two months later. So she, she accounts a lot of that for helping win the war. And Amon Rousseau's house is in the Rigby. They moved it from Mobile, and it's the, it's the last house in the back. You had to take the tour. So I have brought my grandchildren into that house and told my grandchildren, this is your 12th generation ancestor's house. You walked on this floor. Not many Americans can do that. It just shows how we, we station our people. You know, they don't hold the map. They like the love they never had. I could talk the rest of the night, but uh, I want to just suggest that if you haven't been to Grand Prairie, to see the National Park and the replica of the church where they were done, uh, it is, it's fabulous. You you can also see, I think, that the area past the, the, uh, the, the National Park, the low, it goes down, and it's probably it's reclaimed land. They show you how they reclaimed it and stuff. It's very, very, very yeah. interesting. The Royal Proclamation is on display in the church. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. uh, one question, and I'm trying to, when you mentioned the John Winslow deal with the Puritans and, and how he's the one who started all of the, the trouble with the, uh, with the French, the queen never acknowledged that. The, the, king, the king of England never acknowledged that he was involved in that. They, they didn't know he was doing this, and yet. The last letter sent from England to that, that bad dude Lawrence, they told him do not do what they had been talking about. But the British government said, do not do it. The Secretary of State George, uh, George Robinson said, why? Because they were, they were selling food to the soldiers. They, they were supporting the British 
And they were British subjects. But there was that push to get it done. But the last letter said, don't do it. But they did it anyway. I'm surprised they didn't punish him for doing they were, it. They gave him promotions. Mr. I mean, money talks. It's all about the money. Mr. Warren, I have a question for you. Yeah. Which is piggybacks on your question. Was the threat of Acadian Catholicism that great that Mr. Winslow was so terrified that with the strong, this is what I'm gathering from you, the strong population of Acadians being Catholic was just a threat to their Puritan Church of England ways. Is that, that's what, that was his biggest beat, the fear of religious takeover or? The first line in that article he put in the newspaper when he says, come join my militia, we shall rid the North of the papists who threaten us and will take over our lands. Yeah, it was that whole thing. And they hated each other. It's, it's, it's ethnic cleansing. It's, it's, it's still what we see happen all over the world today. But, you know, you see in Syria, there was a lot of people forced exile out of Syria about a year ago. There's a big difference between deportation and forced exile. When you're forced exile, you get to pack your toothbrush. They were tricked and they were nothing. It was a big surprise. The deportation is much, it's nothing real drastic. They say it gets in your DNA when you're victims of that. It's in your DNA. I can't say I feel it, but I mean, maybe it makes what Cajuns are a little different today. That's what I mean, and we're ethnicity. And there's so a lot of you still got it? Yeah. Yeah. And, and definitely, when we were young and we were told we couldn't speak French on the school grounds, I mean, that was telling us, you know, we were not good people. Cajuns yeah. were not, they were dumb, they just yeah. couldn't speak. Yeah. Well. And we did it to ourselves, they don't yeah. understand it. We, well, we, we couldn't, we ourselves. were. You couldn't speak French in school, yeah, public school or buildings. I can remember Mama saying, oh, well, yeah, I'll be a I'll be a little sick. Yeah. I mean, uh, that, that there, is a law, there is a federal case, 1980, called Roach versus Dressing Industries with the federal judge in Lake Charles uh, held under the Civil Rights Act that Cage, Acadian or Cajuns were protected under the Civil Rights Act. Now, Roach had sued because the dresser engineers were calling him Del Kunas, so and he was an engineer in dressing. He kept saying, don't do that. He kept doing it, laughing at him, and he sued him. And in a summary judgment by the court, he held we were protected. Now, to do that, he had to find we were not Americans. The Civil Rights Act doesn't apply to Americans. It applies to minorities, Asians, Jews, African Americans, Acadians. But Acadia was never a sovereign nation. It was only a colony of France. But this is what the judge did. He said, what makes a nation? And he listed 10 things common history, common language, common culture. And he checked them off. The Acadians have this, this. He says, I declare Acadie to have all the characteristics of nationhood and Acadians are protected minority in America. So that's proof that we are a distinct minority. You mentioned that you're gonna have a service in uh, St. Martinville to uh, uh, pray for the people who were lost. Is there any record of the ones that were actually lost on those ships? The ones that went down on the ships, yes. Because okay. there are great records of what, how they deported people, because they kept good, good records, yes. Now, we don't know who was on Beausoleil ship. It was a private charter. We only mm -hmm. know about how they exchanged their money when they got to New Orleans. Yeah, they had cards. But some we do, some we don't. Some of those ships that went down, yes, we know everybody. Absolutely. And there's a man, Professor White from the University of London, who spent his entire life. He has captured, captured all the Canadians in the world to date on the genealogy website. So if you ever want to know the ultimate, it's Professor White. Now, if you go to our website, CanadianMuseum.com, we have Stanley LeBlanc, an expert in Texas, who will answer any questions for free. You don't have to pay for it. You just go to the website, you can email Stanley LeBlanc. Genealogy. There's still a lot of big mysteries that we don't know, uh, where some people just disappear. You know, they still search. Mr. Warren, yeah. To that point, we know because of our great 
Cajun and Acadian culture here in South Louisiana that we have thrived. But as you showed earlier, many of the Acadians were spread out through the eastern seaboard. What do you attribute the fact that South Louisiana Acadians from Acadie thrived and that those in our eastern seaboard communities that got scattered on the way did not thrive like we did? I happen to have written an article about that. It's in this book, this book, I always wondered about that. Why did we prosper? Now, I know we were way ahead of them. Smart ones. Because in 1930, it was a depression. Okay? 1930. Prohibition, depression, end of the flapper age, the Cousin de took 30 people on a 17-day train ride to go back to Grand Prix for the first time in 175 years. So these young girls from Kaplan and Abbeville and New Iberia and St. Martin here got to stay in family homes of Acadians, and they remarked in their diaries, this is based on Corinne Dussault's diary. Her family gave it to our museum when she died. We did this book, and these are pictures from her diary that people have never seen. But they all remark how poor the people were in Canada. Okay, now they weren't rich from Abbeville in 1930, but they were a lot better off in Canada. Why? When they left New Orleans, they had a wish list, and the government gave them everything they asked for. They gave them guns, powder, seed, clothing, tools, because they, the government wanted them to bring the cattle. There was a shortage of meat, and they couldn't get cattle. Florida parishes in the north, it was British territory. Florida came all the way to the Mississippi. That's why they called East Feliciana the Florida parishes. That's where the cattle used to be. You couldn't get cattle there. They had to get them a new market. So in Canada, though, those Acadians that snuck back in, they were, they couldn't own land or go to school for a hundred years. So you see the comparison? We got all the help down here, they have nothing. Now, not a lot of them went back. You go to Nova Scotia, 2% of the people are Acadians. They have a few little pockets. They're in the, the church point. The Acadian Isles, you go north, yeah. Yeah. and you can get to the pure Acadians. Yeah. Some of those never went to Florida. And that, that's where our twin is, Tracadi. Yes. So Some of these little villages were never to Florida. They were too out of the way. Well, so over to, to Eric's question, uh, can you touch on they diluted the Acadians on the East Coast, and the Le Blanc became the white, and they took away the name. Yeah. Oh, do I stay or do I go? A lot in Maryland stayed in Maryland. They didn't come with the others. Maybe they had fallen in love with a, a neighbor. Uh, so the uh, corners used to be the Oakland's. What does Oakland mean? Corner. The corner. At the corner. The Le Blanc's whites. There's all kind of examples where they anglicized their names to blend in and they decided to stay. The founder of Baltimore, Maryland was an Acadian. Mr. Wells, you know what his real name was? Dupuis of the Wells. <laughs> How do we know that? He died with no descendants, very wealthy man. So all of a sudden, all of his cousins came, came in to claim his estate. <laughs> so we have to prove their genealogies. That's how we find out who is a duplicate. So if I understand you correctly, South Louisiana being kind of uncharted territory was able to thrive, not gentrify as the Acadians propagated. But to, to, to your point, uh, the South, when they were settling in those other eastern seaboard communities, they were already kind of thriving, they just got diluted. Is that what I'm yeah, understanding? Yeah, yeah. Interesting. And then, after the Revolutionary War, guess what happened to a lot of the loyalists who had lost the war. They had to go back to England or they went to Canada. So guess what they did? Those Acadians who snuck back in never had title to lands, they had settled farms. They made them leave. So they were deported a second time. And a lot of those people went to the Madawaska Valley of Maine, right on the border, before they had set the boundary between America and Canada. There's a river there. And they were settled in that valley. So again, they got screwed. They put the boundary between the two countries right in the middle of the Canadian. So oh, wow. Canadians have their mirror. Now, Fort Kent has a University of Maine there. I've gone there many times. Um, 
when Elvis Presley wanted to marry the prettiest girl in the world, he went to Malawaska Valley and married Priscilla Williams. Old brother to Katie. I'll give you a few other examples. Or the Katie's you know. Ellen DeGeneres is Katie of New Orleans. Uh, Madonna, the daddy is Italian, and her mother's a Bordeaux. She's half a kid. The most popular singer in the world is Celine Dion. She's 100% a kid. What's that young boy from Canada? Beaver, Justin Beaver. 100% kid. <laughs> okay. So that, you know, we're all over. You scratch a little bit, you'll find this. We're all over. What? When well, you look at the, at, the, at the signatures and things at the, at the uh, uh, National Park, like that, Grand Prix, you know, they, they have the signatures, a lot of them are exes and so on and so forth. They, they weren't very educated people at that time. And most of their names were, were phonetically put down and changed, changed the names of the people. Yeah. They say 20% of the population were literate. For pioneer people, on average, you know, you had some northern republics, and you, somebody had to draw up a contract. Um, you made me think of uh, something I wanted to tell you. Oh, here's a myth. Why does the family name in Canada not have an X, and they have an X here? Like Cobo in Canada mm -hmm. doesn't end with an X. That mm -hmm. one doesn't end. Neutral doesn't end with an X. So the myth was that they couldn't read or write, so they put an X and then added it. That's not true. <laughs> That's again putting us. How would I do too? Carl Brasso wrote an article which is in the Louisiana Historical Newsletter, and he proved in 1930, no, wait, 1830, there was a census, and the judge was in charge of South Louisiana was Judge Bryant in charge of the census. So he made the rules of how people had to present their information. He was from Bordeaux, France. B O R D E A U X. So when, when Boudreaux would come in, he would put the X. Because that's the way it's spelled. So before 1830, no X. I can show you and the documents the judge, did. The, the judge would do that. He made that decision. They didn't know what he was doing. So <laughs> but that's how the X came about. Um, women. I just gave a talk in New Orleans about the, uh, the role women play. They were very progressive. Acadia were progressive thinkers. A lot of it came from the midnight. They were women, the chiefs of some of the tribes. And uh, they even converted the chief of memory told of the, the whole Mi'kmaq nation became a Catholic. So the religion was important. Um, but the women were, they had roles as leadership at the time. A lot of that was shown in the trial, the famous trial where Beausoleil, who saw the famous Beausoleil, had just married Agnes Thibodeau. He was accused of fathering an illegitimate child and marrying um, Tebow. And they had a trial. Everybody in the courtroom was a woman. Bosley was defended by his mother, Marguerite, who saw it. And um, the, the prosecutor was a woman. The mother of the daughter was the one that was accusing him of the little girl. And the ruler, the, I think the judge was a man. Anyway, it just showed the problems. You wouldn't then think that that would be the case, but they were very, very involved and progressive. And by the way, they found most of them guilty of having been the father. And the proof was the, um, what you call the woman who helps the little The midwife. The midwife. The midwife testified when the girl was delivering and she was in the most intense pain. She kept calling out Bosolay's name. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> And the judge ordered Bosolay to pay child support. Ted Deer Busan, he refused to pay. They went arresting. When they tried to arrest him, he beat up the deputy. They threw him in jail. His mother bailed him out and paid the fine. Mother did it. Daddy didn't want to do it. 
So it's, there's a lot of stories there, and it's still trying to these things out. Very interesting. Very interesting. If y'all give me an email, you can do it on the internet through the website, or you can give me a card. We do a monthly newsletter. It goes out at the beginning of the month, mm -hmm. and a lot of these stories end up in there. I'm doing a story right now on the greatest athlete in the world who's in the key, Mondo de France. On his maternal side, he's Cajun, and he just set the fifth, fifth world record. And I think, I don't, I, I don't know of any other Cajun that's ever broken the world record for track, but he broke five down. So he'll be in our newsletter. Let's give a big round for Walter.